I would like to thank John for the invitation on here to uh, tell you about the Passover uh, and go through a demonstration of it. Uh, I'll explain it as simply as I can as I go through it. But I want to take you first of all to Exodus 12 for the institution of the Passover is mentioned. Exodus 12 and verse 1 and verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. <clears throat> and if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you might wonder why it says from the sheep or from the goats. Uh, a little lamb was of more value than a little goat. So if you were a wealthy family, the Lord had taken that into account and you were to give a little lamb, but if you were a poorer family and only had goats, uh, it was a little goat that you had to take. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. This, uh, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And we're in, we'll end the reading there uh, and pray that God would bless to us that portion of his word that deals with the setting up of the very first Passover. But before you close your Bibles, I just want you to look at one thing. And if you look there in verse 3, towards the end of the verse, it speaks about you shall take a lamb according to uh, your father's houses, a lamb for a household. Ah is the indefinite article in English. And what they were to do is they were just to go out and they were look look in the, their flocks and just we'll just think of the flocks of sheep uh, solely. They were to look for a little lamb there that wasn't lame, that wasn't injured, it wasn't cut, mm. that had no wounds on it. It was to be, as far as they could judge, perfect. It wasn't sick in any way, and they were to look for a lamb. And they were to take that little lamb out of the flock. Then look at verse 4. And, uh, and towards the end of the verse, it speaks about uh, you shall make your count for the lamb, for the lamb. You see, they were to keep it four days to make sure it wasn't sick, ill, lame, or anything like that. And during that time, it was like a little pet in their home. And that little lamb would have been looking up at them very much like a little dog would look up into your face with its little eyes or your cat, pet cat or whatever you have. Uh, that animal would have been looking up and it would have been their uh, little lamb in a sense, their little friend. Uh, and uh, it would have been their pet, 
having spent the four days in their home. But look at verse 5. It says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. So here is the same little lamb. And it has moved from just the indefinite article, just any lamb out there, through to the lamb, the definite article, to your lamb, possessive uh, pronoun, your lamb. And these people, as they kept that little lamb, would have been realizing that what was going to happen to it, they were putting their trust in this little lamb. It was their lamb. And they were putting their trust in the lamb and what was going to happen to it. Uh, and I think it's very revealing, even before we go through this here, that in those verses 3, 4 and 5, that might have been your story. That there was a time when perhaps the Lord Jesus Christ was just a person. Just someone that you'd heard about. Just someone maybe whose name you'd taken upon your lips and uh, maybe even used in a swear term. But then as God began to work in your heart and in your life, he became a man that you considered. He became the man that stood out from all others. He was above all others. And then there was that point where you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and he became your shepherd, your lamb, your saviour, your king and your lord. I, I want to go through this Passover demonstration here. And uh, this is not how you would see it set up in a Jewish home. What you would have in a Jewish home is really the place settings. And instead of four cups at the front like this, you would have had your glass um, at your place setting, as you'd have your Christmas dinner, if you know what I mean. You would have your plate and your knife and your fork here and your glass here. And instead of four cups like this, your glass would have been filled four times. So that's why there are four glasses. Um, and it wouldn't be laid out like this. These items that are here in these little dishes, uh, they would be in, and this is a, is a Passover plate, Peshach. And they would have been all in here, and you come up and look at it afterwards. But because it's difficult to get some of the items that's in these here, out of this here, I put them into this for my convenience. But this is a Passover plate. Uh, and you can, as I say, you can look at it later on. And I have actual uh, uh, unleavened bread with me. I don't often have it. In fact, uh, I've only had it for the last three or four demonstrations. I find it very hard to get in Northern Ireland, uh, where I live, because there are very few Jewish people in Northern Ireland. And I don't know where I would go to look for it in Belfast, which is the only place I could get it. But a friend very kindly brought it over to me uh, at the end of March from London uh, and uh, I was doing a demonstration down there in Cork, uh, or just outside Cork City, and she brought me a number of packets of it. And so this is the actual uh, unleavened bread that we have tonight. So normally I just use crackers. So you were nearly right in saying crackers at the start. <laughs> Cream crackers, the James Cream Crackers are actually started by a Jewish uh, company in Dublin. So. Now, over 3,000 years ago, uh, the Lord commanded the Jewish people to celebrate uh, this festival. And 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ celebrated this very same festival uh, and feasted with his disciples there in that little upper room. And at that same point in time, he changed it into what we now call the Lord's Supper. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And he has come to break down the middle wall of partition between us. So that both Jew and Gentile are now one in him. Uh, that we enjoy the same blessings. Uh, at one time, the Jewish it was mainly a Jewish church. But now the church is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. We are one in, in him. And the Passover was God's account of the redemption of the children of Israel from Egypt. But it pointed forward to a far greater redemption and a far greater salvation. Our redemption and our salvation 
uh, from slavery and sin and from the hands of Satan who had us bound in, in, in the prison house of sin, as it were. Uh, and Christ came to give us that, that deliverance. Now, uh, it pointed forward, as I said, to that greater deliverance. God had sent Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, with a very simple message. Let my people go. Just four little words. Let my people go. But does any, any of the, the boys or girls here know what uh, Pharaoh's favourite word was? Do you remember what he said all the time? No? He kept saying no, uh, uh, but it was God's plan uh, to bring the people out of Egypt, but first of all to send ten plagues on Egypt and on the king of Egypt for being so stubborn hearted and refusing to listen to Almighty God. And when you read through those ten plagues, you will see that the first nine plagues, which covered a lot of different issues and a lot of different pests and diseases, that those first nine covered only the land of Egypt, where the Egyptians lived. The Israelites lived in Goshen, uh, a part of Egypt to the north. Uh, and when you read about their animals, they weren't sick. When the Egyptian cattle were sick with uh, boils and diseases, uh, but they were free. And when you read about the plague of darkness, there was darkness in all the houses of the Egyptians, but in the houses and in the land of Goshen, there was light. So all of those facts, those nine different plagues, should have spoken very clearly to Pharaoh. They, it should have made Pharaoh realize that here was God, Almighty God speaking to him. But he hardened his heart and refused to let the people go. The tenth plague was different. The tenth plague covered Egyptians and Israelites to whoever refused to obey God's command in that uh, institution of the Passover there in, Genesis, or in Exodus chapter 12. Now since the institution of the Passover, there have been many symbols and traditions that have been added to the Passover table by the rabbis. So over the over the period since about uh, 1200 BC, uh, many different things have been added to the table that you see on it today. But in a strange way, those things still point forward to Christ. The rabbis didn't realize that they would, but they do. And they still point forward to Christ. Luke 22 and verse 8 tells us that there was a lot of preparation went into the Passover. Uh, we read there, that Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. Now you might think that meant just go and buy the food that's necessary for the Passover, but there's more involved in it. Uh, because you read there in Exodus 12 about make sure that there's no uh, leaven in your homes. Uh, and in the spring of the year, when the Passover usually happens this year, if I remember correctly, it was in April the 4th, which actually was a Saturday, uh, the same day as the, as the Jewish Holy Day, the Shabbat, um, and it doesn't, that doesn't often happen. Uh, but prior to that, maybe for about eight weeks prior to that, the mother in the home is very hard working. She goes through her home meticulously looking for anything with leaven in it. In case some of the children have decided to have a midnight feast, <laughs> and have taken some buns upstairs to bed with them, or some toast, or something like that, and she will go through her whole house. She'd be on top of the wardrobe, and she'd be underneath the wardrobe, and down the back of the wardrobe, and she'd be inside the wardrobe looking for anything with yeast in it. And she'd be underneath the bed as well, checking. You'd not be able to hide anything from mama. <laughs> and she does this from top of the house to the bottom of the house. And when she comes to the kitchen, you know, she has her work cut out in the kitchen. Because in a Jewish home, there are two kitchens. So if you can imagine this room here as a Jewish kitchen, there's a kitchen down that side of the wall, and there's a kitchen down that side of the wall. Can 
Can anyone tell me why there's two kitchens in a Jewish home? Hmm. Too many people to feed. Oh, yeah. 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 Sorry, I didn't hear it from back there. They say maybe they have too many people to feed. No, they, don't, they no. don't mix. They don't mix them the and the make. The milk and the meat. The yes. milk and the meat. That's right. Are you going to say the same? No, I said man and the women. No. <laughs> Maybe the wife's a better cook than the man. <laughs> um, no, uh, what they said here was, you're not to boil a kid in his mother's milk. Now, obviously, they didn't have electric cookers and gas cookers like we have and things like that. So their main way of cooking was just over an open fire with a pot. And they wouldn't um, make, for example, and I'll put it into our modern terms, they wouldn't make a meat dish and uh, put... Uh, the piece of beef in that there and cook it and then take it and wash it out and then make something like custard in it with that's made of milk. They wouldn't do that because you're not to boil a kid in its mother's milk. So you can't have a um, milk dish and a meat dish uh, out of the same utensil. So that means you have your uh, fridge and the fridge freezer and you have your microwave and you have your cooker and you have your sink and all your dishes here from meat dishes down the side of the kitchen. And you have everything down here identical for milk dishes. So meat and, and milk. And the two don't come together. And then here you have a special cupboard. And this cupboard carries a lot of other dishes which are used only at this time of the year. Passover dishes. And these will be taken out and these will be washed again before they're used. So there's a lot of work for the mother. But you know, there's a problem. The wife has done all the work, but she can't say the house is clean. Mm. It's only the husband who can say the house is clean <laughs> from leaven. Do you see the problem? Mm. And the rabbis knew that this might cause some marriage disharmony uh, and so they scratched their heads and probably in scratching their heads they became a little bit like me and lost all their hair but they came up with a plan and the plan was called Benakut Hametz and it's the searching out of the leaven so the wife says uh, the day before the Passover I have uh, cleared the house out of anything with yeast in it there's no one uh, there's no leavened bread in the house. Leaven is something with yeast in it. And he says, okay. But then uh, she has left a little piece of yeast for him to find. A little piece of, <laughs> let's say it's, it's a bun. Nice pastry. And they're tasty, aren't they? Yes, they're tasty. Uh, she's left something for him to find. So he gets a white feather and a wooden spoon and a napkin and he goes in search of it. Now there's something that the wife knows about her husband. She knows that he doesn't know where the Hoover lives <laughs> in the house. And even if he didn't know where the Hoover lives in the house, he doesn't know how it switched on. So. It'll take him a long time looking for this little piece of bun or pastry. So in order for her to be kind to her husband, hmm. she hides it where she hid it last year, <laughs> and the year before that, <laughs> and the year before that, <laughs> and the year before that, and it keeps going on. So he has to think, hey, where did she hide it last year? <laughs> it was on the top of the television. <laughs> was in the top of the wardrobe and eventually he remembers oh it was a little coffee table and I put a little piece down here mm. and with the feather very gently pushes it into the middle of the spoon puts the feather on top of it folds it up in the paper napkin and if the synagogue which is a Jewish church is near he walks down to the Jewish church and in the, the courtyard of that Jewish church there's a little a bonfire going and he throws all of this into the fire and now he can come, can come home and declare that the house is ceremonially clean from leaven. Mm. and you remember 
Paul told us something in 1 Corinthians um, 5 and verses 6 to 8. He says, Do you not know that little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And what he's saying is, since you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour, you shouldn't be living old sinful lives any longer. You should be living a new life. And you should be dealing with the sin in your life. You should be uh, searching it out, as it were, and throwing it away and destroying it. Now, you might think that that finishes it, that the uh, wife gets no nothing more to do. But then there's a little ceremony that comes in and it's called Verket Hanir. And that's the lighting of the festival candles. Now, I don't know if John's going to allow me to light festival yeah. candles here tonight. Yeah. I can't. I don't want to burn the place down, John. <laughs> <coughs> um, we have a fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> right. This lighting of the festival candles. And as she lights the candles, and I'll light the first, because you have to concentrate on this. And as she's lighting those candles, um, she will have a book, Haggadah, and in this Haggadah, uh, it has stories and, and prayers about the uh, deliverance out of Egypt. And you can see, for example, uh, just here, they're a little bit further ahead than what I am at the moment, but there is uh, the Passover and the blood being put on the doorpost and the top of the door. Um, she will read a few of those stories and say a few of those prayers from that book as she lights the candles. Now you might ask, why does the woman, why does the wife get the opportunity to do this? Well, the rabbis can't tell us, even though they've introduced this, but it may be because when you think of it, Isaiah 7 and 14 speaks about a virgin uh, giving birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and then when you think of uh, the Lord Jesus actually being born uh, and being presented in the temple, there's a godly man there called Simeon. And, and Simeon has been told by God that he, that he shouldn't see death. He's not going to die until he actually sees uh, the, the Messiah with his own eyes. And it was the normal custom for parents to bring their children up to the temple, their little babies up to the temple. And uh, here are a lot of mothers, not just one mother, not just Mary and Joseph, but here are a lot of mothers coming with their little children up to the temple. And out of them all, Simeon is led to pick out Mary and Joseph and this little baby. And this is what he says. He says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And that's found in Luke chapter 2. So perhaps that's why these candles are lit by the mother. It was through the woman that the Saviour was to come into the world, but also that the Lord Jesus Christ was the light of the world. And Jesus actually said himself, I am the light. And maybe that's pointing forward to Christ. Now the Passover meal can begin. And if you're in, in a, a, a Jewish home at the time of Passover, you can see all the people are sitting. And there are cushions just like this here on the seats. Now it wasn't originally so. Because as we read there, in this manner you shall eat it. Uh, you shall eat it in haste, with your uh, belt fastened and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, why do you think it says that they were to eat it in haste? And eat it with their belt on and their sandals on their feet and their staff in their hand. Why do you think? Any ideas? Because they were ready to leave Egypt? Mm. Correct. 
Yes, they should be ready to mm -hmm. move to, to leave Egypt. As soon as the Lord said go, they didn't have to rush as it were as we would maybe do today, upstairs to pack our cases uh, <laughs> to get ready to go. They had to be ready. The Lord said go, they went out the front door and they were away. There was to be no uh, uh, delay at all. But notice they were standing. Now, why do you think they had to stand? Any ideas? No? Reverence for God? Not to fall asleep. Sorry? Not to fall asleep. No, neither, neither of them. Slaves had to stand. Servants had to stand. Mm. I don't know if you get down here, mm. down to Naba. It's a program about uh, at one of those great big, big man, uh, manor houses, uh, state houses that they would have plenty of in England. Uh, and it was started, the series started uh, with about, in about 1899 or something. And it shows uh, Lord and Lady Grantham with all of their servants in the house, the butler, and all of the other servants who cooked the meals, who washed the clothes, who made the beds, who cleaned the whole house. But the amazing thing is that all of those servants stood when the family were having dinner. Or any other meat. And they were ready then to, to lift some more potatoes and give them some more potatoes or some more meat or whatever vegetable they wanted. And when that meal was over and the family had gone into another room, then they could go downstairs when the, the, the Lord and Lady and the family had eaten. They could go downstairs and have their own meat because they were slaves in that sense. Uh, they were servants. They couldn't sit. Um, but now uh, they sit on chairs with cushions on them to show that they are free men, that they're no longer uh, slaves. Now, the head of the home, who usually leads in this act uh, of worship, because that's what it is for the Jewish people, uh, is the father. And as the, the head of the house, he would wear a white kittle, a white gown that is from here, em richly embroidered, uh, just in white, I might add, not colours, but white, embroidery right away down, and it goes down to below his knees. I, I don't wear one. It <laughs> gets in my way. Uh, and uh, he wears uh, a mitre. And a mitre is a wee hat on his head. Now, it's not a mitre like this, but a mitre that has a wee flat top on it. And he wears that. The kittle uh, shows that he is the priest in the home. And the mitre, uh, yes, the mitre shows that he is the king and the head of the home. Uh, and that's why he wears those two different things. And then he leads the whole family in worship. And usually the youngest person in the family asks four questions. It's called Manishtana. What are the questions then? The four questions. Why is this night different from all other nights? Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? On all other nights we eat leavened bread, but on this night we eat only unleavened bread, and why do we dip twice? And chanting all of those questions, the Father leads in worship, and as they go through the, the, the feast, uh, they then, he then starts to answer all of those questions uh, to the family. Now, you see the four cups that I've mentioned, but remember, as I said, there's only one cup, and it's at your place setting, and it's going to be emptied and filled up again another three times to make four times in all. Now, the first cup is called Kiddushim, and it's the cup of sanctification. So we'll take this cup here, it's the number one. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he would have said this prayer to, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the fruit of the vine. Um, and in that prayer, God was giving, uh, the Lord was giving, Lord Jesus was giving thanks for everything that was on the table. And you may remember that he also uh, said um, in Luke chapter 22, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I, I suffer. For I will tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, some people might have thought that it might be something like 
our present day Shnor that the, the Lord was drinking then? I think not. In light of what he said, the fruit of the vine, that it was probably a, a wine type substance that he was drinking. Um, uh, the same word is used in other places to show that uh, the wine was an intoxicating drink. But the Lord Jesus here wasn't encouraging people to drink to, until they were intoxicated. This was just wine at this meal. So Jesus was speaking off and about to fulfill the Passover truly. Everything at the Passover table is now blessed. And there's a particular order of things that they go through. And the first is carpus. And carpus is this. And carpus is parsley. It's bitter herbs. And it's dipped dipped in salt water and I can show you this is salt water if you want to try it afterwards and um, this they wait until everybody has taken their little piece of carpus or parsley times with that they use lettuce uh, but I use parsley and they wait till everybody has dipped it in like this and then they all eat it together now I'm obviously not going to, not going to eat it now, what does that uh, represent? The carpus is taken and put in the salt water and eat it together. The salt water represents the tears of life and slavery. And the parsley, being immersed in the salt water, represents the bitterness of life without redemption and without salvation. Uh, so uh, they're thinking of just what it was like in Egypt as slaves. And you remember they were groaning and they were moaning and crying out to God because of the hard labor that they were suffering. The second thing that they take, and remember as I said, all of these things here would have been in, in this Passover plate. They take a little piece of uh, unleavened bread, matsu, and they put this on it, and they eat this. This is horseradish. You all know what horseradish tastes like? Yes. Well, you come up and smell it at least afterwards, and you'll know then what horseradish uh, smells like. And immediately you take that horseradish, there's a battle between your senses, your sinus, and your uh, and the horseradish. And if you take a, a big bit of, and they do much more than what was in that little piece there, there's a battle, and you know who wins? The horseradish. And there's tears. The horseradish actually causes you to cry. Now, you might ask, what does that represent? Well, again, it just represents uh, the bitterness uh, uh, and the trouble and the tears that they shed during slavery. The amazing thing is, in Matthew 26 and verses 21 to 23, Jesus said this, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to ask, Is it I, Lord? Remember, he had 12 disciples. And they weren't, as at that time, sitting in chairs as we know today. But they were reclining, lying on a, probably an elbow, and with their feet stretched out behind them. And they were reclining at the table. And when Jesus said that, they all began to ask the question, Lord, is it me? Lord, are you saying it's me who's going to betray you? And even Judas said that. And Jesus went on to say, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. And in verse 25, Judas said, Is it I, Lord? And Jesus said to him, You have said so. You have said so. And this is the dish that they were dipping at the same time as the Lord Jesus. And Jesus was dipping and Judas puts his piece of not so unleavened bread into the dish at the very same time. And even though Jesus had said, the one who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me is the one who's going to betray me, Judas still says, surely you can't mean me, Lord. But he knew already in his heart what he had planned to do because he already made plans to sell the Saviour for 30 pieces of silver. Now, can I ask you, 
Do you think 30 pieces of silver was a king's ransom, if I can put it like that, for the Saviour? Was it an exceedingly great amount of money that he got? You think no. Is that right? What do you think? Was it a lot of money? You, you think it was? Well, no, I'm afraid you got it wrong this time. <laughs> the young gentleman behind you is right. It wasn't a great amount of money. It was the price of a slave in the slave market. There was another man who was sold in the Old Testament for 20 pieces of silver, and that was Joseph. And the Christian economists have worked out that with inflation, and there's <laughs> inflation in every economy, uh, at any point in history, there's always inflation, that the price of a slave went up from 20 pieces of silver in Joseph's time Ooh. to 30 pieces of silver in the time of Jesus. So, and I used to think, as a, wee, as a wee boy, just like you, I used to think he got a terrible amount of money and he could retire for life if he wanted. <laughs> but no, that wasn't the case. It was the least that they could give him. And the least that they could give him was just the price of a, of a slave down there in the slave market. And then we come to something else in the third dish. And this is Haraset. And Haraset is, is really nice. And if you take, uh, let's say, one scoop of the last stuff, of the, that, you take a double scoop of this. <laughs> and this is very, very sweet. Now, this is just ordinary strawberry jam. It should be made out of... Um, Apples, cinnamon, various types of nuts, honey and raisins, but I'm always afraid of someone coming up and wanting to taste it and they have a nut allergy, maybe even a little boy or little girl. So that's why I just bring strawberry jam, but it's something very, very sweet. Now, what, what does it represent? Well, the Jewish people say that it represents originally the mortar that held the bricks together as they were building all the big storehouses and the pyramids in Egypt. Uh, but it also represented something else. It showed that the bitterest of toils can grow sweet when you can see the end of your slavery. They knew something was going to happen fairly soon. About this time last year, my daughter got off school to do the equivalent of her intercert. And uh, because of the various subjects she had chosen, she was going to have to start exams, let's say next week, and run through until about the final nearly the final week in June. And she was basically saying, Oh, I'll never see the end of these. They'll kill me, Dad. Mum, there's so many weeks exams. And so and so in my class, they're finished in three weeks' time. And uh, we were trying to tell her that, Oh, just take one day at a time. But as it got near the end of the exam, she was saying, Oh, it was only 72 hours to go. It was only 48 hours to go. It was only 12 hours to go. She could see light at the end of the tunnel. It was exactly the same for the Jewish people. They could see light at the end of the tunnel. They could see their deliverance was near. Uh, and so there was that sense of almost joy. Then we come to the next thing. And this is Haraset. And Haraset is the bitter root. Um, and uh, that bitter root, it should be a horseradish root. Uh, I have only one friend in Ballamoney where I live who has horseradish, and if I went every time to ask him for a horseradish root, he wouldn't have any horseradish in his garden. <laughs> uh, but that uh, mm. has, uh, has a ret, um, it means that life can be better at times. And it certainly was better for those Israelites. They were slaves from the moment they were born until the moment they died. And then we have here Hagiga. And this is a roasted egg, yes. And I say a roasted egg. It's really a hard-boiled egg. It should be actually sliced, but you can imagine the mess if I tried to lift up a sliced hard-boiled egg, and dipped in salt water and then eaten. Now, what does it represent? You may remember that the original Passover demanded the death of a particular kind of animal. What animal was that? We animal. You shall pick a. Lamb. What was it? Lamb. Lamb. There's somebody else to say. Lamb. A lamb. 
But since the destruction of the temple in AD 70, there have been no lambs killed at Passover because they have no temple now in Jerusalem. And that original sacrifice was called Hagiga. And that's why they have an egg. This egg represents that sacrifice that they can no longer have uh, because they have no temple. Um, they don't eat lamb at Passover. You might think, well, they can eat lamb at Passover. Uh, no, they don't eat lamb at Passover. They maybe eat, uh, eat uh, beef or chicken or turkey or uh, some other meat like that. They might, some may, may even eat pork, but they will definitely not eat lamb. And then the final thing is this, and that's the shank bone. I should have asked you what it is first. <laughs> it's a lamb's shank bone. A lamb's shank bone. And there's a verse in Exodus that I should have read, I think it's verse 46. Exodus 12 and verse 46. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. You shall not break any of its bones. It was roasted in fire, and fire uh, usually speaks about the severity of judgment or refining something or punishment and it was roasted in fire but you shall not break any of its bones who do you think that pointed forward to Jesus yes because you remember that when uh, the Sabbath drew near the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jewish leaders didn't want him hang on the cross on the Sabbath or any of the two other prisoners that were crucified with him. So they said uh, to, this, to the centurion, we want something done. And the centurion ordered his soldiers to go and break the legs of them. And I'm told that in crucifixion, what would have happened was that with the nails being driven through the palms of your hand and through your feet, that you were going up and down on the cross like this. I can hardly do it because I can't. But you know what I mean. To give some relief to your feet, you were hanging on your hands, as it were. But in your hands, there was so much pain going through your hands that you had to stand on your feet. And remember those nails in your feet? That it was excruciating. So you were seesawing, as it were, up and down, up and down, up and down the whole time. But then when they broke your legs, there's no way you could get yourself pushed back up again. And eventually, your whole diaphragm here would have come up and contracted and uh, you would have just suffocated to death. Um, and that's probably what happened to the other two men. But the Lord Jesus Christ had already died and not one of his bones was broken. Then they put a spear into his side and out flew blood and water. Now we come to the second cup and this is the cup of plagues. And the Father, he takes this as does each person around the table. And you remember that Pharaoh hardened his heart against letting the Israelites go. And he hardened his heart nine times. And for each of the times that he hardened his heart, the, the father and everybody at the table puts their finger into the glass and they put a little drop on their plate. So they have nine little drops of this uh, on their plate. And uh, they, that uh, represents those nine plagues. But the tenth plague to come was the worst of all. It was now that the blood of the, the lamb was taken and sprinkled on the lintel and the doorposts. And we're told by the rabbis actually that what they did when they, they killed the little lamb, they caught its blood in some kind of a basin, some kind of receptacle. Uh, but let's imagine it's, a, it's something like a baking bowl. And they got a piece of hyssop and they put 
the hyssop in, used it as a paintbrush, and they did this. What sign was I making there? The sign of the cross. The sign of the cross, yes. And that's what the rabbis tell us. <laughs> um, that they, they would have done that. And you see, again, it is pointing forward to the cross of Christ mm. without them ever knowing it. Um, so again, that's just another thing. Salvation and redemption would come for all who obeyed God's instructions and who used that blood. But for all Egyptians and any Israelites who said to themselves, well, this is not for me. I don't want to trust in the blood of this land. There was no salvation and there was no redemption for them. The firstborn in the house would die. On the table, on the Passover table, there's a, call, there's a bag which is called Matsotosh. This is an actual Matsotosh here. And the writing here says, um, to the honour or to the glory of uh, the festival of the Mass of the Unleavened Bread. And in it are three compartments. Maybe not the easiest to show, but there are three different compartments in it. One, two, and three down here. You have to believe me that's there, yeah. A piece of unleavened bread in each. And th this matzo tosh has these three pieces of unleavened bread, three layers in one bag, and uh, it represents a unity. Now, if you ask the rabbis, what unity are you speaking about? Some of the rabbis will say, well, it represents the unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you happen to ask some others, they'll say it represents worship, it represents uh, the Levites, uh, the, pr the priests, the Levites, and the people. But you and I know of another unity, don't we? <laughs> Who's that? The Trinity. The Trinity, yes. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the amazing thing is that... Um, I noticed something I forgot to put out on the table. They take in the middle out of the middle and they break a piece of uh, matzo out and the father gets a piece of linen uh, it's just a replica of it and he takes this and he goes and he hides this in some place in the house now when we challenge the rabbis if you say it's Abraham, Isaac and Jacob why do you break Isaac in half and say we haven't any idea <laughs> but if you ask the others who say it's worship that it represents and it's the priests, the Levites and the people and you say well why do you break the Levites in half they say we don't know but if it's Father, Son and Holy Spirit the Son was broken in death for us now, this is called the Afikoman here. It means it comes later. And it, it will come back into play. And when you look at unleavened bread and uh, you, you see it, you see it's, it's filled with little holes. Yes. Lots of little holes. You can walk look at it later and you can taste it if you want. And you can see that it's striped. It's, it's cooked on a very, very hot, uh, in a very hot oven on a wire mesh. And you can see stripes, and maybe that's the better way to hold it there. Uh, you can see stripes. Um, unleavened, pierced, and striped. And remember, he was pierced for our sins, and with his stripes we are healed. So even the unleavened bread points forward to Christ. Now, it's at this point that the family who are all sitting have a big meal. And I have to apologise to you. Mm -hmm. That's the part I forgot to bring with me tonight. <laughs> it's usually a five, about a five course meal. And a real Passover meal will last at least four hours. It's, it is a big meal. And if you're ever invited to a Passover, if you had a Jewish friend and were invited to a Passover, 
remember you're going to be presented with such an amount of food that you'll think food is going out of fashion but they really do enjoy their Passover meal and there's a lot of, a lot of food to eat and after the meal's eaten and after they've had the dessert and everything like that comes the afikoman and the afikoman being hidden is brought back well the father sends the children to go and look for the afikoman mm. and whichever one finds it and brings it back to him mm. he usually gives them some sweets so we, <laughs> we, I would suggest he gives them all sweets so he doesn't just send them away <laughs> but when it's brought back um, he breaks it and he gives a little piece to everyone sitting at the table and this is what the Lord Jesus Christ did to his disciples and this is what we do in, this, in the second of the Lord's Supper today each of us takes a little piece of that bread that represents his, his body that was broken for us uh, and the Afikoman itself when you think about it it was broken I've already said the Lord's body was broken in death for us it was hidden he was placed in a tomb out of sight he, it was brought back to the table again he was resurrected from that grave, from that tomb and you see how even that points forward to Christ then we come to the third cup and this third cup here is called the cup of blessing or redemption in this cup they're looking forward to the Messiah remember Jewish people don't believe that the Messiah has come yet and they're still looking forward whereas we are looking backwards and we realize he has come and Jesus took this cup and he spoke of a new covenant this is a new covenant in my blood and saying that this new covenant had now come in his blood uh, Jesus was saying that he is fulfilling all of those Old Testament prophecies that he was fulfilled of them all and he certainly was and there's 400 approximately 400 testimonies or um, prophecies in the Old Testament that uh, point forward to Christ that have all been fulfilled to the exactest detail to the minutest detail but those around the table will repeat Psalm 107 verses 1 and 2 we will give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy so they're thanking the Lord for their redemption and of course they're just thinking of a physical redemption in history um, 3,000 years ago or so uh, out of Egypt and from the Jewish National Hymn Book and I'm sure you all know what that book is the Jewish National Hymn Book Psalms. 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 Yeah. the book of Psalms they sing Psalms 113 to 118 and those Psalms are called the Hallel Psalms Hallel, Hallelujah means praise the Lord Hallel just means praise and they sing those um, Psalms just one after the other uh, uh, at the Passover meal and then we come to the final cup that we have here along the front and this is uh, the cup of praise and the family says when they lift this cup uh, and that means literally uh, the year the coming one in Jerusalem or if we can put into better English next year in Jerusalem and it is their hope and it is their intention that next year they will be in Jerusalem celebrating uh, a Passover meal in Jerusalem. They want to do that at least once in their lifetime. And if they do that, they never come back again. They've done, they've done their wee bit, as it were, uh, and they don't come back again. And as, as they say that, then the father, he would say uh, to, the, let's say, the youngest son in the house, Son, can you go to the front door and see if Elijah is there? Because they have been told and believed that Elijah, the prophet Elijah, is going to come. And that's why this cup here, I should have said that this cup here remains, this seat here remains vacant all through that ceremony, all through the Passover meal. There's no one sits here. This cup is not touched. This is the fifth cup on the table, if you like to put it like that. And that little boy gets up and runs down the hallway with, with the family heading after him. And he's been told to expect Elijah, probably with uh, long white hair and big beard down here and big flowing gown on. 
and he's going to be standing outside the front door. The wee boy very expectantly opens up the front door to find nobody. <laughs> Disappointed. Because you know something? Elijah has already come. Mm. Who was that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus down at the River Jordan, he sees this young man walking towards him. And you can just imagine what was happening. John sees uh, the Lord Jesus walking towards him. And he does this here. And he's looking past the heads of the people. And the people wonder who he's looking at. So they're turning around and maybe even dividing themselves up to see who John's looking at. And he just puts his finger out and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And every Jewish heart there would have realised what he was speaking about. They realised, as he said, Behold the Lamb of God. They didn't think of only one Lamb, the Passover Lamb. They'd been thinking of, uh, of the one that was sacrificed in order that they might have the redemption and they might have their salvation out of Egypt. But here was G uh, John saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'd like to thank you for your attention this evening for all of the, the questions that you answered. Uh, and uh, I trust that you enjoyed this presentation of the Passover. Thank you.